Oh, my goodness. Just a reminder, we kind of left off yesterday looking at um, the great altar of Zeus and Athena at Pergamon. And so I just wanted to make sure to do like a little bit of review before we kind of wrap it up and move on to our next artwork. So remember that in ancient Greece, it was very common for um, them to plan and to put altars or temples um, on sacred hills. And so in Pergamon, on top of the hill, you can sort of see it kind of leading up here, kind of this command. This is kind of the propylaea, the walkway there. It's elevated. And so here we have an entire complex. So the complex not only had our great altar, but it had temples to Zeus and Athena. It had a library. It had garrisons for soldiers. It had the palace for the ruler. And it was next to the market. So this is like the market area here. You can see the stores, right? And so we were looking at our great altar and we said that there's gonna be a ceremonial fire right there. And that's kind of where you would bring offerings to Zeus and offerings to Athena. But as you're kind of walking up the staircases, you are surrounded by these monumental Hellenistic sculptural reliefs. Right, and the theme, if you remember, is the gods versus the giant, which is a common decorative motif on temples. And so, content-wise, right, we have Athena, and she's missing her face. Right, she's missing her face, but here we have Athena. Right, she's kind of in this panel, kind of in the center, and then she has Aquinas. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, so I apologize. Kind of by his hair, right. And then his poor mother, who's kind of falling out of the frame here, has to watch in horror as her giant son is conquered by this goddess. And then behind her, we have other knightly figures, right? So those victory figures kind of around her. So how is it Hellenistic? So this is a good review. Why don't you guys talk to each other in your table <laughs> And re, re, um, see if you can remember how Hellenistic is different than classical. So go ahead and chit chat, and then we'll get going on this. Okay, so what's the big difference between Hellenistic and classical? What's some of those big differences? Yes. Right, there's a lot of drama. So not just drama in the body posture and the positions, but in the faces. So look at the anguish on the faces of the two giants. Uh, we don't know what Athena looks like, but you know, she could have been really determined. Or she could have been cool, calm, and collected. We don't know. Um, anything else about them? What about their proportions of their body? How are they different than in ancient, uh, to be classical Greece? What's different about their bodies? We saw this developing in the late classical period. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In late classical, they often were elongated, so their heads were smaller, and they might be eight heads tall. Now, these figures still might be seven and a half heads tall, but their proportions are definitely different. Remember the weary Hercules that we showed and how he looked like a bodybuilder rather than just a athlete, like a simple athlete, like he looked like a bodybuilder. Notice how kind of over the top the muscle structures are. It's almost as if every muscle is flexed on their body. Does that make sense? Like there's really no relaxed pose anymore, which we you were getting to at with as well. This idea that they're extremely active in their pose, exaggerated activity, exaggerated poses, exaggerated drama, exaggerated muscles, right? And so they look like bodybuilders. Even Athena, right, has broad shoulders and muscular arms. You see that? So 
we have these figures. The Hellenistic is really known for its larger than life sculptures and larger than life characters. They're overly muscular, overly dramatic, a lot of use of diagonals, right? Diagonal lines are always more dramatic than horizontal, right? Horizontal is like calm and peaceful, and verticals are like upright and strong, but diagonals are really dramatic. And one of the other characteristics that we'll see that plays into the other images we'll look at today is notice how deeply carved in the fabric is. The fabric doesn't necessarily feel as soft and as billowy. They really did carve in deep to get the eye sockets. We actually could see that happening when we saw like the Alexander the Great imagery. His eyes were kind of sunken in. And you see that here on these figures too, like really dark shadows in their eyes and then in the spaces like under their arms and then in the fabric. So these are some of those formal and contextual um, elements that we see on works from the Hellenistic. So the video, um, we didn't watch the whole video, but you're obviously welcome to do that. I mean, I love the fact that these figures are kind of coming into your space. Notice how that knee rests on the stair, right? And so it really is dramatic. It's almost like watching theater, right? That they're become, like it's interactive and you kind of become part of this fight between the gods and the, God, and the giants. Right? So here's some examples of that deep carving, sunken eyes. Look at the, the carving in the hair and the texture of the hair. Right? So how are the reliefs symbolic of current events for the day? There's many theories about what this is about, right? Obviously, the imagery is about the gods and the giants, and we have seen the Greeks do this before as allusions to things between like Athenians and Persians or the different city-states. So some people believe that if this is related to current events, this idea that Attalus I, he was Alexander's half brother, he had some major confrontations with the Gauls. And there are many images of the Gauls at Pergamon. And we'll actually see some that are in the 215, just a few moments. And so it was to kind of illustrate the command of them over the Gauls, right? So that would be current events. Others believe that it also would be symbolic against the, of the Persians but not the earlier defeats, but the uh, um, Alexander the Great defeats of the Persians. So it's symbolic of these other battles. So this is, some other imagery that comes from Pergamon, um, and this is called the dying gall, right? This is the dying gall. This is actually an archaic image of a dying soldier. And so when you look at this Hellenistic piece, how is it different than the earlier images of dying and suffering? Like what's Hellenistic about it? It's not a bodybuilder this time. What's different? See if we can see them different angles. What's different? Yes, maybe. Right. And so this is like that more cool, calm, and collected, right? Imagery. Um, he's kind of pushing his body up to kind of continue the fight. And we see that sort of here with the dying gall as well. We can see in the Hellenistic period, this is the time after Alexander. This is the, honestly, the influence of the Romans. The Romans were really into realism, right? And so we can see that there's a little bit more sense of the anguish on his face, but also in his body, right? We can see the texture of his hair, right? And so that was something that they often did is wanted to show the differences between like the ethnicities. So the Gauls had like a rougher sort of hairstyle. It's got, he's got like a, a necklace around his waist, but also his body. If we look at his body, it is still muscular. So if I show my opponent as strong, 
it makes me seem even stronger, right? Because I was able to conquer someone who was great. And so there are several of these different monuments there. Here's a close up of it. Um, this one is a Gaul soldier. It's basically a suicide, right? Instead of being captured, he kills his wife and himself. But you can see how dramatic the poses are, right? It's almost like that climactic moment. You think about Greek theater, right? Greek theater was big, right? And so this is that climactic moment in the story. Okay, so our next image that we have is number 37, the, vic the winged victory of Sama Thrice. You've probably seen her a gazillion of times. Okay, so I'm going to let you guys take a moment and based on the visual evidence, what is the function or content of this sculpture? So what is the function and content? I gave you a bunch of things to kind of think about. So as you're discussing, what does she do? Like, what is she on? What is she doing? What is her body pose? So like, what is she doing through her body pose? And what's the condition of her clothing? And then I put this image here too, so that you can kind of see it in relationship to size. Okay, so discuss if you can kind of figure out the function slash content of this work. Go ahead. We're like being little investigators here. she's ready for battle right so what what makes you think she's ready for battle right she's got a very dramatic like lean forward oh i like that her her clothing is being pressed back into space by some sort of force right so that maybe looks like she's about to take off yeah She's a guide on a ship. I like that too, right? Is there any visual evidence that talks about that too? What about the condition of her clothing besides the pressing back? Any ideas? Yeah. I do like it is and this could be the way that it goes like if her not her after she might be on the ship. Right. It could be the spray, right? And then her clothing is wet. Right? So we think, right? Actually, we know it was a part of an altar, right? And so it was a part of an altar, and possibly the altar had a fountain, right? So that she was actually wet, right? She was actually wet. This is, of course, Las Vegas, where you see everything, right? So we think she was on a ship, right? And we're not quite sure. She could have been holding a wreath. Which would be a symbol of what? What's a wreath a symbol of? Anyone know? Yeah. It's a victory symbol, right? So she might have been a victory, right? She could have been holding a horn that was blowing a call, which might make sense if she was on a ship or going to battle, right? She would have been painted 
just like almost every other marble we've seen, right? She would have been painted as well. She also could have just had her hand raised in gesture. We're missing her arm, we're missing her head. So we can, and, and there really isn't like at the rubble, there wasn't those parts there, right? But some of rice is on an island. And so it's in an island in the Northern Aegean. And so it was a sanctuary. Um, so it had a cluster of buildings, all dedicated to the worship of the great God and the ceremonial mysteries. Does anyone know what mysteries are all about? Mysteries, if I say that. Oracles were very common in this day. Almost every Acropolis or holy site had an oracle. So people could like predict the future. They would tell you if you should go to battle, if you should um, get married, like they would help you kind of plan your life. And so there was all of these rituals and religious rites that people did. And so this was a pilgrimage site. So people went to Samothrace to kind of absorb themselves in these different cult mysteries, as well as to worship the great God. And the sanctuary, which we have a little video of, was in kind of like a theater area. Can you see that she was probably in a little niche and there would be a seated area around her? So it would be a place where you could like witness different ceremonies taking place, but instead of standing, you would be seated. And just like any other, right, just like any other um, Greek, you know, holy site, it was on a hill and this island overlooked the water. And so has anyone ever been to some islands before? They're extremely windy, aren't they? Right? You get wind from the, from the, um, all the water, right? And so it makes sense that the fabric is billowing in the air and that she's kind of like caught in the wind and she's striding forward. And if I go back to the image, right? If I go back to the image, She's striding forward and her wings are kind of like the other victory we saw. They're helping her, right? She's balancing forward because her wings are out so that she's like standing strong in this powerful gust, right? So very dramatic sort of pose. I think we sometimes fail to see that because it's a really beautiful, overly used image that we see all over the place. We see it in banks and we see it in buildings and whatnot, but because it's out of the context of not being in the original site, we don't necessarily see it. Okay, um, I'm gonna go ahead and pause the video just so that you kind of get an idea. Um, I actually just saw in the news, like like some art history news line that I, I kind of um, partake, participate in. I actually saw that they are recreating this site so that you can go and visit it and see what it looks like. So this is just a 3D model of what the entire site looked like. So you can see that she was perched behind this seated area and there was countless temples um, overlooking the water. So you can kind of see it through. Once again, where are they building their temples? In the natural environment. So wherever you are, you would be able to see the beauty of the world, right? You'd be able to see the beauty of the natural environment. This is gonna be very different than the ancient Romans. The ancient Romans would have excavated, got rid of all the earth, been flat and axial, right? They would have just kind of clear cut it and built in it because they like to command their spaces. Whereas the Greeks in, like, were interested in, in like, um, creating their works inside of the natural environment. So you see the Ionic temples, you can see, you know, trees, gardens. Here we're back into the, another seated area. And I think we're back almost to where we began, if I remember right from the video. Oh. 
I am wrong, right? So once again, just kind of going to the start here, she would have been kind of like on the back wall overlooking the site. Okay, so I was recording in class and I paused the video um, that you will see the link here so you can get it to it from the presentation. And it kept the audio of me talking, but it didn't show it. So then when I went to go resume to record, I didn't, I was not recording a single thing. So this is just me adding on a Saturday morning to our discussion. So we discussed the functionality of this imagery based on its visual context, but there's a little bit of information at the site that tells us even a little bit more specifically about what this sculpture was meant in that location. And so it was an offering representing the victory on a prow of a battleship. And so overlooking, you know, the GNC that would make sense. And so it was there to proclaim the victories of the Greeks in important naval bat bat um, battles. And so once again, thinking about that pose, how that conveys that victory. It would have been made out of white Paros marble. Paros is one of the Greek islands, um, north, um, more northern um, than Santorini, which we discussed earlier when we looked at the Aegean art. Um, it's really known for its white marble that's used for sculptures that we might have seen on the Acropolis. It also has some gray marble that comes from the islands of Rhodes. Very similar to a lot of Hellenistic pieces, it is larger than life. So the victory herself stands about nine feet tall. And when you add that to the ship at the base, it's about 18 feet tall. She's wearing a kiton. Um, so instead of wearing a pliplos, which we saw in our core, she is wearing a kiton, which was a common dress that women of the day would wear. And then, like we said before, looking at those other images, she would have probably had her hand raised and she would have either been holding a trumpet, a wreath, a fillet, or maybe even just gesturing um, a greeting. Because in 1950, they actually found a, a hand and it had an open palm with outstretched fingers. She, so she could be just su su suggesting greeting in that pose. So when we look at Hellenistic sculpture versus classical, one of the things you'll notice is the drapery. Notice how deeply carved the drapery is around her waist and around her legs. It's just not as smooth and refined as we see in some of the pieces like in the Nike Athena um, from that temple of Nike Athena. So the next piece that we have is the seated boxer. And when you look at the imagery, you might um, think about it's telling a story. So do you think he won his boxing match? I would like you to watch this smart history article on the seated boxer. So go ahead and click that from your presentation and watch it. And there you're gonna get most of the notes for this artwork. So one of the characteristics that you must notice is that this is made out of hollow bronze. So this is from the lost wax process. So many of these sculptures have been melted down that we don't have very many of them. But this is a great example of how the Greeks were able to use bronze in their sculpture. They didn't just use marble. And so notice how besides the bronze, the wounds are emphasized using copper to make it look like he's bleeding, right? A lot more realism in Hellenistic, maybe with the influence of the Romans, being that Hellenistic is a Roman 
style. Um, when, you know, after the death of Alexander the Great, the Romans were really interested in realism. So it could be the Greeks did it first and then the Romans copied or vice versa. So when you look at the body of the boxer, right, you'll notice that there are a lot of similarities to classical. What are the classical characteristics of his body? You might notice that he's still very proportional. He's probably seven and a half heads tall. Um, his head is not too big and it's very proportional to the size of the rest of his body. He also has a youthful body. So despite the age and all those wounds on his face and his knuckles, you do see that he has a very athletic build, even though he's a much older man with that beard, right? And um, the, you know, kind of like the weariness that we see in his face. But of course he's classical, excuse me, Hellenistic in that he has a much more expressive um, pose as well as a more expressive expression on his face. So that ends the images that we have in the image set. Um, another famous piece from the Hellenistic is the Lacoon group. This is actually found today in the Vatican Museum, so you'd have to go there to see it. And so comparing this to Mabel, maybe the scene of the Temple of Zeus and Athena, figures, you can see a lot of similar characteristics, that deeply carved hair, the sunken eyes, the expressive faces. All of these sculptures are colossal. It once was recreated, so they rest, restored the sculpture, and so this is what we think the image looked like. This is based on a scene of from the Trojan War. Lacoon basically foretold the coming of the Trojans, and so the the Trojans sent serpents to um, stop him from um, telling the city that um, it was uh, an invasion. And so you see the serpents wrapping around Lacoon and his sons. This would have been in the Vatican collection when Michelangelo was painting the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. So we'll revisit this image as well as several other images that are in the Vatican collection so that we can compare how Michelangelo used it as inspiration. You know, just worth mentioning right now, look at how beefy Adam is, right? He's not a slender man. He's kind of a bodybuilder-like type, which was very common looking at like Lacoon here. And then as well, notice how God really looks like an image of Zeus, right? He's got the beard and the white hair. So here's the back of it. This is a colossal sculpture. I believe it's like 16 feet tall if I remember right. So during the Hellenistic period, Rome came and, and um, dominated. And so that doesn't mean that they didn't continue to add to the city of Athens. This is a Corinthian temple at the base of the Acropolis. You can see the Acropolis kind of peeking through here. Now this temple was colossal in scale. The Romans, as we'll see in the next units, really made everything bigger. For the Romans, bigger was better. And so here you can see those Corinthian capitals on the top of these colossal columns. The last thing to really mention about the Greeks is their theaters. So just like their temple complexes, the Greeks really built into the natural environment. So this Greek theater was built into a hillside. And so you would have a center area where the actors would be um, performing the plays. And so they would be in the center kind of arena area there. They'd also have a platform in the back so they could you know, have sets and scenery as well as different rooms in the plays. And then there's even a top platform there as well. This back here would be for storage. So we might have storage of props and scenes and costumes and the masks that they wore um, for their Greek theater. Now, why I bring this up is that the Romans are gonna take this kind of concept of a semicircular structure, and they're gonna add a second one to the other side. And so instead of building into the hillside, the Romans are gonna dominate their landscape. 
So they're gonna build up and make a circular structure and this will become their amphitheater. So a great example of this would be the Roman Colosseum. So the last thing that I did in class was I had students work in groups and draw diagrams of the three different Greek orders of architecture. And so I have in a bag um, parts of these temples um, color coded into blue, purple, and orange. And so you need to separate them into those color codes. And then you want to draw those three orders without your notes. So see how much you can do without your notes first. You want to label each part. Then when you struggle and you're not quite sure where to put things, you can bring out your notes. The reason for drawing these diagrams is I really want you to keep in mind where the different parts of what the different parts are and how they relate to the sculptures we've seen. Where will we see those sculptural reliefs and where will we see those full-fledged sculptures on the Parthenon? So you could take some time to do this yourself to see if you know the different parts. Considering you don't have my little pieces, um, you could also refer to your notes and see if you can remember the parts. And so kind of to end the class, I showed them the different parts of the building. And so I also showed, oh, I must've opened it up to another, of course I did. So now it's not here, but that's okay. I'll just talk through it as well. So on the Acropolis in the pediment at the top, so that triangular section, that's where we're gonna have the Helos imagery and the three goddess imagery at the birth of Athena and the wars again, or excuse me, the contest between Poseidon and Athena. They're gonna be placed in that triangular section. They're full-fledged in the round three-dimensional sculptures. In the metopes, right? So in those little squares in between the triglyphs, that's where we're gonna have the images of war. So giants versus gods, um, lapis versus centaurs and so on. All four sides have different battles based on mythology. The frieze is gonna be smooth, but inside the cella, there's running friezes. And that's where we're gonna have images of the, the Ergustines as well as the horsemen. And those are all based on the panathetic procession. So kind of keeping in mind those different parts of the temple. Okay, so what do you need to know for the quiz we're going to take? Make sure that you know the characteristics of each style, know the different vocabulary, focus on the general Greek history and how it inspired Greek art.